What started out as a simple and affordable way to get out of debt and achieve home ownership in an ever increasingly expensive real estate market has rapidly morphed into a global movement of alternative housing to be used in an ever increasing number of scenarios. From tragic natural disaster relief to housing homeless veterans or establishing communities of like-minded people, the tiny house movement has been on the move for over a decade now. From the asset-rich investor with land who wants to run the tiny house as a business to the ADU or additional dwelling unit in someone's backyard where they rent it out on Airbnb, or maybe it's the adults who want a home nearby for mom and dad to live in on their property, or just the parents who want to give their 20-something children a start with their first home. Make no mistake, the tiny house movement is on fire. Stay tuned to discover the unexpected impact that tiny houses are having on a giant real estate world and what that could mean for you and your real estate business. Hi everybody, my name is Chris and I want to thank you for joining us for another value-packed Tenant Cloud podcast. If you want to be a more informed, better educated, and successful landlord, then stay tuned. With over a decade of property management experience, we bring you short and sweet, bite-sized pieces of incredibly valuable property management tidbits in 15 minutes or less. At one point in time, tiny houses were considered a fringe lifestyle. However, they have quickly become the go-to solution for all kinds of real estate issues. From housing the homeless to being an ADU in someone's backyard for a relative to live in or to simply be a rental property, tiny houses have made a big splash in the real estate market. They've also been used in disaster relief efforts around the world in one form or another, which makes it somewhat surprising that it is rather easy to find hundreds of articles from so-called real estate experts that bash and trash talk the tiny house movement. But just as any movement such as this one, you'll always have those in support and those against. But that's not what really matters. The reality of tiny homes and the movement behind it is really all that matters. And they're gaining popularity and the statistics definitely speak for themselves. Here are some interesting statistics on tiny homes from research conducted by thetinylife.com. 68% of tiny house owners have no mortgage, as opposed to traditional homeowners of whom 70% do have a mortgage. 55% of tiny house owners have more savings in the bank than the average American with an average savings balance of over $10,000. The average cost to build a tiny house on your own is approximately $23,000 as of 2019. The average cost of traditional homeownership is approximately $272,000. Tack on 4.25% interest over the course of 30 years, and that is a whopping $481,704 just to own a home. And that does not include any of the maintenance costs or taxes that go along with it. The average traditional home is 2,100 square feet, which is the equivalent of 11.3 tiny houses. 21% of tiny house owners are under the age of 30, 21% of tiny house owners are between the ages of 30 and 40, and two out of every five tiny house owners are over the age of 50. 89% of tiny house people have less credit card debt than the average American, and a whopping 65% of tiny house owners have zero credit card debt. Tiny house owners tend to be well-educated, and the percentage of tiny house owners are on par with the average college graduation rates. More women own tiny houses than men. 55% of tiny house owners are female, while only 45% are male. The per capita income of tiny house owners is $42,038. On average, they earn $478 more per year than the average American. And here's one more st- interesting st- st- uh, can't talk today. Here's one more interesting statistic on tiny house ownership. On average, a tiny house owner reduces their overall energy consumption by as much as 45% as a direct result of moving into a tiny house. That statistic is per research conducted by Maria Saxton, who is a PhD candidate in environmental planning and design at Virginia Tech. And she spent over a year studying the environmental impact of people who moved into tiny homes. For both young and old adults, 
the tiny house market is predicted to grow by over 30% by 2022, according to Business Wire. Even investor Warren Buffett is bullish on mobile homes, which, if you think about it, that is essentially what a tiny home really is. It's a much smaller mobile home that is designed to look like a luxury house or even like a travel trailer designed to look like a house on wheels. If you've ever heard of the term T-H-O-W, a tow, that is a tiny house on wheels. It's essentially a travel trailer, but it's built as a tiny home and they are estimated to last for as long as a traditional built home. The only thing you may have to eventually do work on may be the frame or replacing the wheels. If you think about it, actually, much of what the tiny home industry is doing is taking the stigma away from owning a mobile home by making it look much nicer and possibly safer, as well as rebranding the entire concept. The rebranding comes complete with the tiny house lifestyle, which fits nicely with other movements such as minimalism or homesteading, self-sufficiency, eco-friendly living, and there's many other movements that fit in really nicely with the tiny house movement. And so the tiny house movement is filled with all of these people from all these different walks of life and all of these different goals of things that they want to achieve through tiny home ownership. It's all very brilliant. But the increase in demand in these tiny house properties, it poses an interesting question as to whether or not it'll have an effect on traditional residential real estate. And one might think that so many of these purchases of tiny homes would bring down the price of regular homes, but there are a small contingents of those with plenty of money and no desire for a traditional homeownership experience. But the two markets really are not necessarily the same. A lot of the people who are not buying traditional homes and are instead opting for tiny home ownership are typically, they really weren't ever necessarily going to be a traditional homeowner to begin with, although we will get into that in a second. According to a lot of research, um, a large majority of people would actually rather have uh, the experience and space of a traditional home for family but eventually, and only if they're ever in a position financially to achieve that goal. So what value does a tiny home really offer? For older people, it's a low maintenance option for living. Very little maintenance. Uh, they don't have to worry about a whole lot. There's not a lot of expenses that go into it, especially if you own the land that it sits on. And as we learned, according to research by thetinylife.com, two out of every five homeowners are over the age of 50 as of last year. So that also brings up the question, so where do tiny homes fit in the life of a young adult? The other 42% of people under the age of 40 who are buying these tiny homes. If you think about tiny homes in the same way as traditional real estate investments, um, such as those that build equity in traditionally sized homes, what it does is it, is it the tiny house, house movement extends the participation in that activity to those with lower amounts of income and usually lower credit uh, limits. And so while there may not be the same type of appreciation as a traditional home, depending on what you're doing with your property and with the tiny house that you're building, there are ways to build equity and to get a return on that investment, either in the short term or long term. And you can see that by going into various groups uh, on Facebook or just online in general of tiny home ownership groups and the various ways that people are generating revenue as a direct result of their tiny home, tiny home lifestyle. It's interesting, in the life of most young working adults uh, with or without student loans, owning their own homes is not necessarily a reality anymore. It's not a guarantee. Uh, a par popular article that was recently published on Medium titled Millennials love Zillow because they'll never own a home. Real estate apps and Instagram have become a digital fantasy land for broke millennials. And the article is interesting because it discusses the fact that for many millennials, traditional homeownership is simply out of reach for them financially in the places that they want to live. And so if you take, for instance, the Austin real estate market, a lot of young people have been priced out of that real estate market simply because it is just too expensive for them. They can't afford it. And so for many millennials who are able to achieve traditional homeownership, uh, even for those that can't afford it, they simply choose not to because they don't want to be tied to a 20 or 30 year mortgage 
And they also don't want to be throwing away a significant percentage of their income towards just a house. Uh, there's a lot of articles and research that's been done and polls that have been done uh, with millennials and Gen Z where they value experiences more than they value physical things. And a house is one of those things that they would prefer not to be spending two or $3,000 on per month if they can be spending that money, that same amount of money on experiences such as traveling and trying new foods and going and hanging out with friends and just doing the things that create memories as opposed to things where they're just stuck inside of four walls uh, and spending their money on those things. And so it's an interesting shift in the mindset of the current generations and how those mental uh, shifts and mindsets are having an impact on the real estate industry and on the tiny house movement. And so as a result, those people, they tend to either end up renting or they go with alternative home ownership options such as tiny houses. The possibility of owning a tiny house also is impacted by um, the change in opportunities in the workplace and living more remotely is possible now because of advances in wireless technology and remote work options. Whereas just a decade ago, it was nearly unheard of to have high-speed internet in rural areas, and now you do. You have that in rural areas. I live in a relatively rural area, about 30 minutes outside of any major city, uh, and I'm surrounded by uh, quite a few forests and not much development, and I have access to high-speed internet. In fact, I am recording this podcast and we'll be uploading this podcast from a remote location. And so the opportunities that people have now to work remotely to have access to high speed internet and things of that nature is more available than it ever has been before. And that's only going to continue to improve uh, over the next decade. And so the movement is also enabled by companies that are adopting work remote programs. Uh, and even entire work re remote work uh, forces for their entire company. And so a lot of cities are starting to offer incentives uh, to companies to um, have remote work opportunities as they continue to try to reduce traffic levels, reduce the overall number of people commuting on roads, and so on and so forth. And so companies are starting to discover these uh, cost benefits of not having to have employees come into an office space, but being able to work uh, out of their homes. And so all of these influences amongst many others are having a significant impact on the real estate industry and on the tiny house movement. And whereas people were influenced uh, in their real estate decisions previously because they wanted to be or needed to be close to their place of employment or close to this or close to that, they don't have to do that anymore. And the options that are now available to them are more than, they have more options than they've ever had before. And so uh, along with that comes things like improvements in internet technology and access to high-speed internet, which continues uh, to make serious strides. And I expect that in this decade, 2020 to 2030, uh, that will be more true than it ever has been before in the history of internet access. And while most people understand that um, the life of seemingly starting all over again at the parent's house or graduating college and uh, getting a starter home, that whole dynamic has also changed. Now, when a person graduates college or even just going to college, I've read stories of college students who are building tiny homes on wheels and they're just they're renting a space for three hundred dollars with all utilities included in an rv park and going to school and it's much cheaper for them to do that than the other options that are available to them and so for a college graduate they can even take out a tiny mortgage or a personal loan for fifteen thousand dollars or so uh, and park their mobile home or their their tiny house on wheels in a friend's backyard or a relative's backyard or just even a space they're renting and they have all utilities included and they're living for less than $500 a month in this uh, this tiny house on wheels. And so it's a huge option for an entire demographic across all age groups um, 
this has become a an option for them in in real estate and to become a homeowner in the sense of uh, having four walls and a roof over their head that they actually own as opposed to traditional home ownership, which comes with the uh, the mortgage note and the taxes and upkeep and the maintenance and stuck in a specific location and so on and so forth. And so that also enables them to stay out of debt early on as a young adult. And so at the point that uh, if you if you remember the statistics that we went through with the tinylife.com statistics through all that research, you remember that uh, the average American who is a tiny house owner has much less debt than the average American who is not a tiny house owner and they have more money in the bank and they have a whopping, I think it was 68% has zero credit card debt. I mean, that's incredible. Uh, and to be able to do that at such a young age is such a... Uh, shift in the dynamics of finances in the United States and the current situation of how people are in debt today in America, um, it's just, it's huge. And the tiny house movement is having a huge impact on that. And what that ultimately does is that allows them to build up their credit and to not have mortgage and to not have debt. And it may be actually enabling them to enter the traditional real estate market even earlier than people have typically been able to do so before, simply because of the tiny house movement and all the benefits that come along with that. And so uh, that's the tiny, that is the power of tiny home ownership. And I think that that is the long-term benefit of this movement that has not yet been realized. We're going to have an entire generation, the first generation of an enormous amount of people who grew up with tiny home ownership as an option in the modern world. And I think that that is going to play a big role in the next 10, 15, even 20 years from today. And I don't think that the full impact of tiny home ownership and the tiny home movement has really been realized yet. As always, we appreciate the time that you have taken out of your day to listen to this podcast. We appreciate you spending time with us and we look forward to next week's podcast. Feel free to share it with any friends, coworkers, or family members or just leave us a review on Google or Apple Podcasts, and we would greatly appreciate any of your feedback regarding this podcast. And we'll look forward to speaking with you next time.